week or so ago, I had a message from a regular viewer, a gentleman called Dale in Tennessee. He asked if there was going to be any Aronka C2 content soon. Well, I wasn't intending to, but of course, Dale's the kind chap who suggested I peen the end of this thread over on the Praga oil cap. And I rather poo-pooed the idea at first, but of course it turned out to be a rather brilliant idea. So not risking a poo-poo again, I thought I'd dig out some Aronka bits and show you what's been going on. I first came up with the idea of recreating Jack Parham's aeroplane in 2008. I'd owned the C3 for 12 years by then and collected up various parts in the meantime. So I had an engine, propeller, tail surfaces, half a rudder, and some wheels, and various other assorted bits. Fortunately, a friend in South Africa, John, was rebuilding the Aronka C3 that David Llewellyn flew from London to Johannesburg in 1936. John had been out to the States and met up with John Hauser, who then was custodian of quite a lot of the original Aronka drawings, and he managed to obtain copies of a lot, some digital, some in print, and he very kindly sent me a huge envelope containing the lot, printed and a CD. It was very kind of him. And then in 2011, there was what could have been a disaster, but turned out to have been a massive blessing. The regional airline that I worked for, based at Plymouth in Devon, closed. There was the opportunity to go up to Aberdeen to work through another operator, but I was offered a training captain's position in Abu Dhabi. It was a bit of a leap of faith, but for family reasons, we decided to up sticks and head out to the Middle East with the children. I had nothing to do for a few months, moping around in the office. I don't quite know what was going on. It was the most disorganized airline ever. However, we were on full pay. And so I took the opportunity to start going through the Aronka drawings. It was a good job I did. There's an awful lot of dimensional inaccuracies in the drawings. They're drawn correctly, but a lot of the annotation is incorrect. And so having several months to go through these drawings meant I could cross-reference parts. It was a tremendous use of time. Eventually the airline got its act together. We were sent over to Toronto to do our conversion training and thence afterwards every six months for recurrent checks. I realised that there was an aircraft spruce and specialty outlet at Brantford, which was less than two hours drive west of Toronto. I emailed them and pretty much worked out that I could get everything I needed to really get on with this project. And so for the next four years, several times a year, I travelled between Toronto and Abu Dhabi, business class, with the most strange and unwieldy pieces of luggage. Absolutely everything went back via Abu Dhabi and no one batted an eyelid. I think every project starts off with wing ribs. Mine was no exception. The ply I used is basswood. It's very light. It was the first thing I brought back on my first visit to Toronto. I bought a saw in a hardware store and created rather a lot of sawdust in my hotel room because the basswood sheets were a bit too big to go in my suitcase. Fortunately, I knew which way to cut them already. So I chopped them up, left a large pile of sawdust and a few dollars and a note of apology for the girl who was going to hoover up. My router, Aerolite 306 glue and some thin ply for the gussets came out in another suitcase. We had a ridiculously large villa, much larger than anywhere I've ever lived in before or since. And so I was able to have a section of it as my man lab. James May's series was on at the time and the expression sort of worked. I had all manner of drawings stuck up on the wall. This is the general arrangement drawing for the left wing. It's about five feet long, the drawing that is, not the wing. I don't have the general arrangement drawing for the right wing, but as it's not a Bowman Voss design by Richard Voigt, I think we can assume it's fairly symmetrical. Not all rib drawings were available. That really wasn't a problem. The main difference is the width of the spar, as the spar has various doublers on it, where the flying wires and compression struts go. So the main thing was to work out the width of the spar and then adjust the spar gaps in the ribs accordingly. I made several jigs up. There's five compression ribs in all. Again, they're 3 16 basswood ply with, they look like 3 8 sticks. I'd have to check the drawing, but they look like 3 8 sticks. They're spruce. That one is actually of a slightly thinner profile than the normal ribs. It's rib 15, no, rib 16 rather. That's right, station 16. So from 15, 15 and a half and 16, we're all slightly different. There's four aileron ribs on each side, so you can see 
and shortened at the back there for the aileron. So two of those, then a compression rib, which is full size, full profile, two more aileron ribs, another compression rib, and then we're into the full length ribs. So there's two slightly funny ribs, they've got different cutouts because of the spar, another compression rib, and then five standard ribs, which I hope you can see those. So they all came back home in an enormous plywood box and uh, I keep falling over it in the hangar. But last week I thought, because of Dale's message, why not dig it out? I hadn't even seen any of these ribs for several years. I'm very pleased with them generally. These are the standard intermediate nose ribs. These will go at the half settings between stations. Again, they're all different aperture sizes here for the spars, just for the main spar, obviously. There's several trailing edge ribs as well. Fortunately, my friend Miles, who's rebuilding the Ronco 100, he's done a lot of metal work. So he's been an absolute star and he's doubled up on everything. So I've got a lot of metal work as well, ready to go, including all the clips for the compression ribs and aileron hinges, more aileron hinges, aileron bell cranks. There's a great pile of stuff. So there's a lot more to the wings than sort of starting off from scratch, which is great. I also did all the sensible things like buying hardware. So I've got all the turnbuckles needed. Each wing is wire braced. They're very much First World War style with eight uh, piano, yes, eight, eight at the top and eight on the bottom piano wire bracing wires, each with a turnbuckle. It's not a cheap exercise making authentic Aronco wings. The turnbuckles are over a thousand pounds now, if, even if you hunt around. As for wing spars, they're being made at the moment. A very good woodworker who makes yacht masts is making the blanks for me and shaping them because the top is slightly shaped. He's a really good chap, so far better he does it than I do it. I should get them fairly soon. If I get them later this year, which I hope, then the plan will be to stick all the doublers on and do the wing root work and make various fittings and then possibly get on and start building wings next year. I kept coming up with the excuse that I don't have enough space and up to a point that's true, but actually it's because my space is badly used. I've had a good measure up and I've got room in this shop for one wing and room next door for another wing as long as I go and put the fuselage down in the hangar for, a, well, a year or so, I suppose. I don't think one should underestimate what these wings take. They're a lot of work. As for the fuselage, well, you've seen that when we've been doing things like testing propellers and engine runs. It contains a few original tubes, but about 95% of it was made by me in Abu Dhabi. The tubing came back from Canada. I bought it back in lengths of ABS gas pipe, generally five inch diameter, and I got away with the longest length I could find, which of course I cut down in my hotel room to the right length, taped the ends up and slid all manner of lengths of 4130 in it. I made a jig that was made from plywood left over from the Boeing C-17 simulator installation at Abu Dhabi airport. There was so much plywood, me and my friends went and took sheet after sheet. One friend built a whole shed in his garden using this stuff, complete with air conditioning. I finished the forward fuselage in Abu Dhabi and then bought it home when we moved home in 2016 and put it together along with the bottom frame that I've made in Abu Dhabi in my workshop here in Cornwall. It's largely complete. It needs sandblasting and covering obviously, but at the moment in its bare metal and sprayed with oil state, it's very easy to store. It's not very fussy. I can't poke holes in the fabric or scratch the paint or anything. I have had the tail on it, it's all been rigged properly and it does have all the control cables made properly as well. So there's not a great deal to do on the fuselage. The main thing is to finish the seat. The seat that's in it was a bit of a tryout. I'm actually going to remake the seat. I want it slightly lower so my head is less likely to bash the top longer on and it needs a little bit more bracing. I then need to fit the firewall, the fuel filter and make some very rudimentary cowlings. The bottom cowling's a bit odd. Unlike the C3, it's not a bowl. The wires go external to the cowling. I haven't quite worked out how I'm gonna make it yet. 
I'm not going to commission anyone else. That would go against the way I'm doing things, but I might come up with a rather novel way of making it. So that's the story so far. I'd like to think the wings might be made next year, in which case it could possibly fly in 2025. Anyway, as always, like, comment, subscribe. Do post any questions, as long as they're not difficult. Thanks for watching.